Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you're joining for the first time, this is part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one vendor or solution that we review independently. And then we have a bunch of stories from the week related to ERP and digital transformation. For today, we have a very exciting vendor called Aptin. And Aptin, from the corporate strategy perspective, it's a very, very uh, interesting company because the way they operate, it's going to be similar to other companies that are private equity owned. Uh, their strategy is going to be really acquire a lot of companies and bring, bring together in the portfolio to grow as fast as possible. Now, there are pros and cons to that. We are going to discuss all of that. Before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intro. First, I am going to start with my intro. If you don't know me, I am Sam Gupta. I am principal at Elevate IQ. I have been part of uh, the ERP and digital transformation engagements for more than 20 years. Uh, we have done quite a big bit of work related to Aptine. So obviously, this winter is very uh, you know close to our experiences. Uh, you know, as part of Elevate IQ, we are the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. Uh, we help our clients with business process uh, re-engineering. Uh, it's going to be anything that happens in the pre-implementation phase, which is going to be defining the inter enterprise architecture, business architecture, uh, you know, contract negotiation, ERP selection, and the ERP implementation. On that note, I am going to move to Dave for his intro. Thanks, Sam. Hey, everybody. My name is Dave Chrysler, and I own an operations consulting company working with manufacturing business leaders to help them connect the planning people process and technology needed to grow their business. I come to you with more than 20 years uh, in the manufacturing space, directly responsible for operations. So thanks for having me, Sam. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Dave. Andy, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Uh, my name is Andy Pratico. I've been involved with ERP software for manufacturers for four decades, which is a long time. I worked all over the uh, United States. I worked all over Canada, over a thousand manufacturers in my career. And I actually teach companies how to uncover the truth about ERP systems before they buy. I have a published book on Amazon. And uh, thank you very much, Sam. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Andy. And uh, we are going to start with today's uh, story. And before we do that, uh, if you are in the audience and uh, if you're joining for the first time, make sure you guys comment uh, because our panelists are going to review them and we are going to be covering all of the questions uh, or the commentary that you might have related to your experiences uh, with Aptine. So make sure you guys are commenting. Uh, and if we cannot get to them uh, during the show, then we are going to be covering them after the show. We'll, uh, our panelists will get back to you. So the very first story for today is coming from our friends at Oracle. And as we know, Oracle has been doing a lot of work in the healthcare space. Uh, we recently covered the story that they acquired the um, EHR player called Cerner. So obviously, they are really eyeing for that healthcare space. Uh, obviously, that you have a lot of custom development play there, and companies like Oracle, Microsoft, they want to get into that play because obviously they want to sell the ERP system, but they also want to sell the database and the infrastructure, and that's where they are earn a large dollars. So that's why Microsoft and Oracle, if you uh, uh, look at them, they are really after verticals such as healthcare. So in this particular case, they have. Uh, they are strengthening their capabilities overall in the supply chain space. As we know, supply chain is one of the biggest problem for companies and supply chain is going to have its own intricacies the way they work. For the healthcare, obviously in healthcare, the hierarchy of how the vendors are going to be, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the purchase or the managed care organizations that you have, 
they have a very different structure and the hierarchy the way those relationships are set up and they typically drive how the supply chain processes are going to be so in this particular case they have launched a supplier rebate management now rebate could be very unique across the industries as well now if you look at b2b distributor they could have a very different rebate function the way they they want to treat uh, their uh, suppliers or the customers uh, in this particular case uh, you know the healthcare is going to have very different function overall from the rebate perspective and they are really strengthening their position in that space so here uh, they are saying the decision making in healthcare is often driven by contracted sales which would mean any of the organization that are actually doing the sales in the healthcare space typically these are going to be third party companies and is heavily influenced by distributors group purchasing organizations gpos uh, gpos are common in the other industries as well healthcare is going to see a lot more uh, than the other verticals and then managed care organizations managed care organizations are only going to be applicable in the healthcare space maybe a little bit in the healthcare insurance space uh, but really healthcare is where their play is and then uh, you have the government regulatory bodies as well obviously they drive a lot of these things so here managing supplier relationships and medical supplies is a constant challenge and that's why they are introducing this uh, management in most cases in the mid market i think this functionality is going to be done in some sort of spreadsheet uh, but obviously when you are that size when you are that big then you need slightly more streamlined process to be able to manage this now healthcare organizations often depend on supplier to calculate and issue rebates uh, and they don't have any visibility to valid, uh, validate the accuracy of rebates now if you actually look at the functionality this is almost like three way matching process because you want to make sure that you know whatever is being claimed by the supplier you are <laughs> able to validate that you need to look at your own data and you need to look at your own algorithm to be able to validate that now that could get very complex it's almost like sales compensation but sales compensation for third party uh, again there are a lot of moving pieces there because when you have third party involved you need to have slightly tighter scrutiny you need to have scrutiny when you have uh, your internal processes but in case of third party definitely you need to be slightly more careful um this is part of the cloud supply chain and manufacturing the scm uh, component that they have this is part of the fusion umbrella uh, so obviously it is part of the larger solution they don't have this functionality uh, in case of netsuite so i want to uh, be clear there uh, the manage this uh, the channel revenue management automates trade program uh, processes and settlement in the cloud uh, now uh, we have some flavors of the trade management that we have seen in case of qld as well uh you know they have a lot of this functionality because they do really well in the international supply chain management uh and they had the global trade promotion component that we have not seen in any other erp's systems that we have reviewed probably that is going to be either in larger systems or the systems that are going to be designed for those international supply chain processes uh i uh don't have see anything else here uh, here they are saying with full integration with oracle cloud erp oracle fusion cloud procurement oracle fusion cloud order management and oracle fusion cloud inventory management so all of these are going to be integrated uh, obviously this is a very composable erp so a lot of these modules are going to be the systems and themselves so that's why they are saying that they are all integrated with this obviously that integration is going to be a key for the for this module to work and here uh, they are saying supplier uh, rebate management enables customers to manage the entire supplier rebate life cycle the rebate itself is going to have uh, its own workflow the way you would have crm workflow or the would the way you would have your product workflow so they are able to manage all of that from the rebate contract program management tracking to performance analysis in addition by providing a complete automated solution it eliminates uh, you know many previously manual and time consuming rebate program process, uh, processes do you guys have this, any this comments? type of product would normally be targeted at like fortune 1000 size companies sam is that right depending upon how strong your rebate component is uh, you know we have seen this problem with a lot of smaller companies as well to be honest when you are dealing with a lot of different associations when your relationships are going to be super strong um rebate is going to be one of your formula to get their attention to be honest 
Okay, and depending upon how complicated your rebate calculation process is, uh, because that actually drives sales. So, uh, you know, a lot of companies need it. I think it'd be interesting to see that uh, you mentioned about the complexity of, you know, working with the various vendors. It'd be interesting to see how that really ties in and how much of the manual processes they're able to eliminate uh, with this with this upgrade. Yeah, exactly. I am going to completely agree with that. You know, uh, I think the majority of the SMBs, they must be tracking it manually. But when you are tracking the entire life cycle, we have seen, even in case of some of the very small distributors, let's say if they have the marketing fund management program. Now, that marketing fund management program could be very involved as well, because you need to track the funds. You need to make sure that you are able to pay them when they are going to claim, they are going to have invoices. Uh, so it gets really crazy. Now, supplier rebate management is similar as well. The only complexity in case of supplier rebate management is going to be really at the product and SQ level. So I think that's one layer deeper, in my opinion. OK, uh, so I'm actually going to move to the next story. And the next story is coming from Oracle as well. So Oracle obviously is doing a lot in the supply chain. And supply chain is where the companies are really struggling. So here, they have really beefed up their capabilities in the logistics area. Uh, and they are saying the new logistics management capabilities within Oracle Fusion Cloud Supply Chain and Manufacturing, which is the SCM component as part of the, the, the bigger solution that they have, the updates to Oracle Fusion Cloud Transportation Management Obviously, those bigger solutions are going to require the, uh, you know, the TMS component as well, because the transportation management itself could be very involved. And that's where a lot of complexity is, to be honest. When you talk about this in the whole concept of integrated supply chain, having the visibility into supply chain, when you're, uh, you know, if your goods are getting shipped over multiple hops uh, across ocean or train, you need to get visibility into that. If you are going to be late, you need to have those signals incorporated as part of your ERP to make sure that your production process is not going to be impacted because of any sort of challenges in the supply chain. And that's a huge, huge, huge problem right now. Uh, for the most part, these processes are done manually. Uh, that's a huge challenge uh, you know, for a lot of companies. So they are introducing that as part of the main solution. So here they are saying, uh, and by the way, the, they have provided an example of Western Digital. Now, WD is the company. We, that's the size of the company that we are talking about. Obviously, for them, the supply chain is going to be extremely involved, and they are going to have far bigger problems. So as you can see, they have roughly half a million shipments every year. Obviously, that's a lot. That's a humongous company, as you can see. Uh, and their supply chain problems are going to be far deeper as well. They definitely need this to be automated. Otherwise, they probably need an army to uh, manage uh, this these kind of problems. So here they are saying, uh, you know, with cloud transportation management as our foundation, we have been able to streamline logistics processes and customer support, quickly achieving significant results, including reducing cost, service disruption uh, through expansion of our partner base. By the way, in the electronic space, the supply chain is far more involved. Uh, because you are going to be collaborating with the international supply chain for sure. Uh, you are definitely going to have pres presence in Southeast Asia for the most part, uh, just because that's where you are going to get chips. Uh, you know, a lot of electronics is actually manufactured there. Uh, so China is going to be another country that is probably going to be uh, in the mix. And that makes the supply chain process very complex because, you know, you are literally talking to the other part of the world. Uh, and you have a lot of challenges, uh, you know, because of that. Um, and, and in general, the supply chain in the electronics industry is very complex, just like your automotive, uh, the way their products are structured, the way their supply chain is structured. So here, what they have done, and they have done some really, really cool stuff that are going to add real value to the business. Uh, you know, when we talk about AI machine learning, we don't really hear the actual business scenario. Here, they have done something really, really cool, which I absolutely appreciate. So what they are saying is intelligent transit time predictions, OK? A new machine learning algorithm in Oracle TMS will enable users to evaluate the potential impact of both macro level uh, you know, interruptions, OK? Now, those macro level interruptions could really jeopardize your whole production process if you are going to have uh, you know, issues in your supply chain, if they are able to really predict accurately, obviously the accuracy of the prediction is going to be a question, 
the machine learning algorithm, they get richer over the period of time. Obviously, it all depends upon the data quality uh, and the sophisticated, uh, how sophisticated these algorithms are. Uh, but at least they are able to do something uh, in predicting the macro level interruptions. Uh, they are also able to predict, predict the network level disruptions such as labor and capacity shortages. Now, that is super meaningful if they can pull it off. Uh, here they are saying this can help customers more accurately predict delivery times and lower cost associated with delays, expedited shipments, and additional safety stock. Obviously, this is a huge pain for a lot of companies. So I'm glad that they are actually bringing these feature sets. Now, the second thing they are talking about is enhanced shipment capability. Supply chain leaders can simplify and automate transportation processes for shipments. New capabilities include automated spot bidding okay guys spot bidding is where the real money is uh again you need some sort of automation for that uh and in such industries for example let's say if you are talking about electronics steel you definitely need to uh you know figure the game out because you know that's where you are going to have a lot of dollars uh you can save a lot if you can if you can take advantage of that so here they are saying they are able to do automated spot bidding and the ability to combine and track multiple ships shipments in Oracle transportation management. Uh, and that's where you know they can get really good rates, to be honest. I mean, uh, for the SMB companies, they are simply going to have the rate shopping software. That's the extent of it, but they don't really have the whole bidding component, the spot trading uh, in terms of the rates. But when you are bidding for the airplane or uh, for a, a, a plane, that's a different uh, you know case altogether. Uh, you know, there's a different ball game the way the uh, global trade management works. Uh, there are a lot of different moving parts overall in that whole supply chain. Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting story. Do you guys have any comment? I can take those or move to the next one. Okay, so the next story is coming from IFS. And here IFS is recognized for their abilities in the service industry, as we know, IFS is a very field service centric solution. Uh, it does really, really well in the places where you are going to have extremely strong service component. It's also very, uh, it works really well in the airline ecosystem that we have worked and when you are gonna have the MRO and those MROs typically have very strong service component because their service life cycle is going to be one of the thickest that you are gonna see just because of the size of the the repair that we are talking about, the intensity of the repair, the timeline, uh, you know, the, the, the tight timeline that they have uh, in making sure because, you know, any minute that you are going to exceed is going to cost them millions of dollars. So obviously you need very tight control on the pro processes. So here, uh, you know, no surprises on the news. So basically what they are saying is the IDC has recognized IFS uh, for the SLM vendors, which is service lifecycle management. Uh, here they are saying this uh, IDC marketplace report uh, assesses the capabilities and business strategies uh, of SLM vendors based on a comprehensive framework covering para parameters, including offering landscape pricing model, customer-based growth strategy. IFS has established an end-to-end -end service lifecycle management platform which supports a broad set of functional processes within service on the IFS cloud. And the industries that they have highlighted here are going to be medical devices, farm, construction, industrial machinery, equipment, aerospace, defense, high tech, consumer products, and service providers. Guys, one thing to note is a lot of these industries are going to come across as if they are talking about manufacturing. IFS in general is not a very strong manufacturing solution. Okay, it's going to struggle with the core manufacturing when you are a manufacturing shop. It's not going to have as deep manufacturing functionality. It's going to have very strong the service uh, centric functionality. And when you are very strong in your field service component, that's where your large dollars are. Uh, the manufacturing is not as a strong component. Maybe you are utilizing contract manufacturers for your manufacturing, but you are really the installer. That's where uh, you know you could uh, the IFS solution is going to be super uh, strong. So. Uh, make sure you are paying attention to the industry when they are saying medical devices you know a, a lot of these medical device companies may not be the manufacturing themselves they might have be have a very strong installation component as part of their business model manufacturing may not be as strong 
the farm is again farm equipment service companies as opposed to the real farm farm uh, because when you look into farm accounting ifs might struggle because it's not really designed for that the same thing goes for construction industrial machinery as well when you have these large assets that need to be serviced in the field that's where ifs really shines Okay, I can take some comments. We're, we're strong with uh, project management too, I believe, Sam. Is that fair? Yeah, so uh, obviously they are uh, going to require very strong project management functionality for these large assets, uh, you know. Uh, but again, their sweet spot is going to be really that field service functionality. That's where they are really strong. They are going to have the depth in the transactions the way service companies work. So you are going to see for richer functionality in the field service space, you are not going to see for it that rich functionality in when you have hybrid manufacturing, complex manufacturing, you know, uh, managing scenarios of industry 4.0. Uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with that. Hey, Sam, we got yeah. a, a comment uh, from somebody in the audience, uh, Anders Green, kind of going back to the uh, Oracle article in terms of the um, uh, added capabilities on the logistics side. And Anders is asking, how much do you see companies wanting to track different modes and sections of transportation? Uh, as in, I have a shipment due on you know X date versus I have an ocean freight uh, shipment due on X date followed by a train due on Y and followed by a truck due on Z. I mean, my standpoint is it, it really comes down to the size of the business. And in the example that we talked about managing you know, a half a million uh, shipments, that's obviously going to impact the the visibility that you're going to need to see. What about uh, from your experience? Yeah, so from my experience, to be honest, it really depends upon what business model you have. The majority of the SMB companies, what they are going to do is they are going to outsource their entire transportation. They are going to be working with something like 3PL. Uh, you know, they are not going to have their in-house fleets. But when you are that big, you cannot rely just on partners. You have to have your own capacity as well. So most bigger companies are typically managing their own capacity uh, in conjunction with working with these 3PL suppliers. And they are typically comparing the rates. They are comparing the risk, uh, you know, which is going to be uh, better for them, basically. Uh, in the SMB space, we don't see that. But that is not to say that uh, you are never going to see the transportation fleets managed by smaller companies. For example, let's say if you go to businesses such as frozen food uh, or any of the small food businesses, you are going to see heavy transportation component with those businesses because 3PL cannot really ship for them. They are going to have very specific requirements the way they ship because, you know, sometimes they may have very tight, uh, tight deadline uh, with the shipment because if they don't ship by then, the food is going to be wasted. So they like to have far more control in their shipment process. So again, I would say, depending upon how your business model is, depending upon how deep you are in the transportation component, transportation overall is going to be a big pain for most companies. And these days, it's it's much bigger. Uh, for bigger companies, they definitely are going to have very, very, very strong PMS component as part of their process. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, so now the next story that we have is coming from our friends at Acumatica. And Acumatica has made a very, very, very interesting move. Uh, and that I don't think anybody was really expecting. So they actually, uh, you know, the CEO who was really influential with their growth, uh, the way they grew in last, you know, eight to 10 years. I think, you know, John Roskell has done a marvelous job uh, for Acumatica. But now the new CEO is here. And this happens with a lot of companies that are going through that PE life cycle. PE companies like to have a CEO uh, that is going to have the experience where they are trying to get to. Uh, obviously, they must have felt that John Roskell probably does not have that experience. So they are bringing uh, you know, another CEO who probably have richer experience in growing this company from this point to the next phase of growth that they are trying to, to grow. The most interesting part about this replacement is that the person who is coming, which is, uh, I guess the name is John Chase. Uh, if you actually look at his background, he does not seem to have uh, any sort of uh, you know, ERP background. Uh, if you are trying to penetrate the ERP market, as we all know, ERP market is very different in general. If you have sold teams, if you have sold any sort of technical systems, if you have sold CRM systems, those are very, very, very different companies. 
Okay. Uh, the other point to note here is they seem to be um, very tightly affiliated with Microsoft for some reason. Obviously, the the P companies that we have that has invested in Acumatica, uh, you know, uh, has uh, IFS in their portfolio, but the executives that they seem to be getting are all from Microsoft for some reason. John Roskell actually came from uh, from Microsoft, and now the new CEO is also from Microsoft. So I don't know what that alignment is. Overall, from the business model and the corporate strategy perspective, Acumatica has similar approach as Microsoft, where they like to be slightly more hands off the way they are managing their channel. Acumatica has similar strategy for OEM model, where they simply want to sell a bunch of licenses to these dis distributors and let them, uh, you know, figure out how they want to implement. Uh, that strategy has pros and cons, both, you know, from the revenue perspective, it's an amazing deal because, you know, you can sell a lot of licenses and then let them worry about whether they are able to sell or not. Uh, but overall, from the experience perspective, uh, you know, some of these companies may be trying to oversell. They might not have as much tight control on their channel. So it does fire back at times. And this is the challenge that we see with Microsoft all the time. When you have a reseller that is really strong and tightly, uh, you know, they sort of know how to implement an ERP, great. But if you have a technical company that has never implemented an ERP, they are developers, they are trying to develop a solution on top of that, and they are in the OEM model, we see a lot of implementation failure because of that. So here, this is a very, very interesting move uh, because of the CEO's background. I don't know how the uh, channel is going to change. I don't know whether they are going to change the strategy uh, or not, but this is a very, very, very interesting move. Have you heard of Unify Square before, uh, Sam? Yeah. Okay, and what and what do they do? Well, so they are really in the very, again, they are not in the ERP space. They are very technical-centric company. They are more in the CRM space, uh, you know, more telecommunication, uh, messaging. Uh, yeah, they really are not uh, oh. in the ERP space, yeah. And uh, by the way, I mean, John, case uh, was very influential uh, with the, I think, Sky for Business or the team's uh, growth when teams really uh, picked up the growth, Microsoft Teams uh, picked up growth. Uh, I think uh, John Case was really influential. But again, when you are, you know, selling messaging platforms like WhatsApp or, uh, yeah. you know, Teams, it's a very different deal than selling any IP system. Not nearly as uh, complex. Uh, all right, so I am actually going to move to the to today's topic, which is going to be Actine. Uh, unless you guys have any other comments on today's stories. Okay, so today we have a very interesting vendor called Aptine, and I am going to brief you guys on the Aptine uh, overall corporate strategy, the way they like to think, the way they like to operate. So the best comparable for Aptine is probably going to be either ECI uh, or it is going to be in four. Uh, as we all know, in four grew because of acquisition. They started somewhere in 2004. Uh, F Teen, the name, the brand came about somewhere in 2012. Uh, you know, because two companies got merged, they you know coined a really cool name called F Teen. Uh, but obviously, they have a very long history of the systems where they actually came from. We are going to review all of that. So, from the corporate strategy perspective. Their uh, strategy is very similar to Infor, where they acquired a lot of different systems. Their goal was to integrate them together, you know, make these ERP systems purpose built. Uh, so basically, you end up with a lot of different products from the companies who didn't really have as much cash to develop these products. And typically, when you are going to have the smaller companies that are going to be developing the product, they are obviously not going to have as many dollars to document the product the way ERP product is supposed to be documented, okay? And that documentation actually plays a very important role overall in the journey of the product because nobody really documents that. The people who were supporting the product to begin with, uh, you know, those people might leave the company. Uh, you know, that happens a lot because you might have 50 people that might were actually selling the product the reason why they acquired, you know, maybe that system had, I don't know, uh, 100 customers, 200 customers, or maybe 1,000 customers. They acquired them because of the niche market, and they obviously wanted to sell more products. That's why they would acquire these companies, and these people 
will end up supporting. And typically, if you look at the, the corporate strategy of ECI, uh, strategy of N4 and Aptin, they are not going to be very channel driven because it's very, very, very hard to find partners that are going to learn 200 different products. It's very, very, very difficult. You can have partners, uh, you know, uh, selling only one product. So how are you going to sort of, you know, segment your channel? So this is how Aptin typically operates in the market. Uh, you know, they are very direct in their, uh, you know, operation from the corporate strategy perspective. They have a lot of different overlapping product overall uh, in a lot of different industries. And, you know, when I was looking at their product pro portfolio, it's still very confusing to this date. Okay, and I could not see a very concrete corporate strategy, which products are they going to support in the cloud, which are the ones that are receiving the most dollars from the R&D perspective, which are the products they are going to kill. By the way, one more point about Aptain. In case of ECI, ECI is acquiring only the products that are going to be your ERP products. Epico right now is acquiring a lot of edge products. And the reason why they are acquiring a lot of edge products is because they want to fill the holes. So Apico strategy is great because they are actually trying to win these fields in these micro spaces. But in case of Actine, they have they still support a lot of different edge products. We are going to see that in their uh, you know when we look at the industry, some of the industries that they have highlighted. When you go to an ERP company, your hope is going to be that you are going to find an ERP. But in their case. The, the only reason why they support those industries is going to be completely off from ERP. It's going to be some sort of technical system that they are trying to sell in those industries. And they don't really have any sort of presence from the ERP perspective. So it's a very interesting, uh, you know, vendor overall from the corporate strategy perspective. Um, what else do we like to cover as part of briefing that I have not covered? Dave, Andy? I think you'll probably cover it with the further screens ahead, but to, you know, Aptine uh, has a very, very large pro, uh, uh, portfolio of ERP systems, and most of these systems they own have been around for for decades. Exactly, and sometimes when you are dealing with these legacy products, I don't know how much they are able to innovate because obviously you are not going to be spending your R and D dollars on two hundred different products. It's just too expensive. Uh, you know, you are going to be focusing only on a couple of products. So, you know, what is going to be your strategy? You are acquiring these companies. Are you going to kill these products or what exactly are you going to do? Uh, the other things that we have noticed in case of Aptine, because of their acquisition strategy, they are going after very narrow markets. So, for example, the last acquisition that we saw, uh, you know, some of the companies only like to go with one of the largest markets. For example, I think we saw this in case of Salesforce that they didn't want to target any of these smaller markets. In case of Aptin, they are purposely targeting the smallest markets. For example, Austria. The recent acquisition that they did was in Austria. Now, Austria market is very, very small, uh, you know, uh, but if a company is going to require Austria localization, now Aptin is going to have that differentiator because none of the ERP that are going to be full suite can really support that um, that localization. So Aptin is going to win over your Microsoft uh, SAP because if you want to operate in those markets and if you require that lo localization, your choice is to go with SAP Business One or, or you know Microsoft Business Central, but then you are not going to get the deep manufacturing functionality. In case of Aptin, they are being very strategic. The way they are moving in the market, they are going for these smaller patches, but at the same time, they are going to have the deep manufacturing functionality that these companies will need uh, because they are not going to have large development dollars because of their size. Okay, so if you guys don't have any other comments, I'm actually going to move to the uh, you know first screen. Uh, and this is the overall background. I wanted to cover a little bit more about their journey, how they started. So the, uh, this is a merger of two different companies, CDC Software Corporation, and uh, there is another one, the Consona. Uh, is the another one uh, that they got merged in August 2012 to form Aptin Corporation. Aptin sells industry-specific software for the financial, manufacturing, and supply chain industries, integrating ERP, SCM, and complaint management. Now, complaint management is a very unique 
keyword that you would find in the ERP space. I don't know any other ERP company that are really playing in that space. So they have a little bit of CX and CRM play. They wanted to always be sort of the, the CRM company as well, along with the uh, ERP company. They are still doing a lot of that. They have uh, you know removed a lot of exposure in the CRM portfolio because it could be all over the place. When you are trying to be ERP plus CRM, I don't know who you are. Sometimes it can be very confusing uh, for the customers, but they are still carrying some of those products and they are supporting them and they are selling to very specific industries that you are not going to find anywhere else. Now, uh, in 2003, they acquired uh, the made to manage system. They have two or three different uh, systems that are their flagship product. Uh, I think they have ROS, uh, that is number one, made to manage is the second one. Uh, Process Pro is another one that is really popular. And what else? I mean, we have uh, you know some captured here, I guess. So we are going to review all of them. So here they are saying uh, made to manage system for 30 million in cash. Uh, originally named China.com and founded in 1997, CDC Corporation was based in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, they had real challenges financially, and that's why they ended up selling. So uh, the PE companies typically acquire these companies in the hope that they are actually going to grow. Uh, and obviously, you know, in their favor, it is working financially. But whether it is working in the, uh, you know, in customer's favor or not, that's that's a question uh, that you know we need to review. So we'll be reviewing all of that. So here, uh, you know, they are saying that Consona Corporation, some of the product actually came from that as well. Uh, a provider of manufacturing business and intelligence. So their roots were the manufacturing business intelligence software for manufacturing operations management. Some of the edge software that you are going to see in case of your app team portfolio, they do a lot of different things such as measuring OEE or just doing MES as opposed to doing the full-blown uh, ERP. Uh, so they have a lot of those components as well. Now, um, the new CEO came in 2018. Uh, what else? The In 2020, they acquired another software company called Paragon Software Systems, and they were the provider of TMS. So we just saw that Oracle is trying to build that thick TMS capability. Uh, you know, obviously, Appteen actually did that as well. Uh, there's another company that acquired GMS. I don't know if you guys remember. Uh, we covered that news in last two sessions. I don't know who acquired GMS. Uh, that was a very recent news. But yeah, companies are trying to get a lot more WMS uh, and TMS uh, capabilities as part of their portfolio. Because obviously, Acumentica has WMS built as part of uh, their ERP. So obviously, if you want to win against Acumatica, you need to have WMS and TMS component uh, as part of your bundle. And that's why companies are really moving in that direction. Some of the Aptine's uh, most prominent product offerings include Just Food ERP. Just Food ERP it has very deep food and beverage functionality that you are not going to find in the small to medium size manufacturing space. The other comparable solution for Just Food is probably going to be DCOM. Uh, and DCOM is with ECI. We all know that. It's a really, really pretty product. It's a new product, but it's very small in size overall. So now ECI has that. I don't know how, uh, you know, just food ERP appears and how cloud native that is, but, you know, DCOM is very pretty uh, and very well uh, done from the user experience perspective. Um, here they are saying, you know, respond for complaints and feedback management, and they are calling that that product out, which means they have really strong exposure in that space uh, to date. Uh, and they are targeting a lot of industries which require the complaints and the feedback management functionality, which typically falls into the BPM space, CRM space. It's very rare to see these capabilities uh, in the ERP space. ROS ERP for process management, factory MES for manufacturing intelligence, uh, and then Apprise, uh, you know ERP for consumer goods, made to manage for manufacturing ERP. By the way, guys, these are only the popular uh, you know, ERP systems they have. They have massive overlap across the product portfolio, and we are going to review all of that. By the way, if you look at their journey, they have done all of this in the last 10 years. Can you believe this? Uh, obviously, they have really aggressive growth plans that any PE company is going to have. But from the sustainability perspective of a software company, sometimes it's very, very, very hard, and you are going to have all the challenges that you are going to face in an integrated solution. An integrated solution is never going to feel 
the same the, the way your product is going to be built from the ground up the experience that you are going to get from products like sap or acumatica because the whole product is designed from ground up uh, in this particular case they are trying to patch a lot of pieces together it's very 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 hard to get similar experience uh now uh you know the other uh news that we have is the consona uh, was founded in 1986 uh as made to manage systems that's where made to manage actually came from that's their discrete uh product uh they have a lot of different process products but this is their flagship discrete products i don't know how strong they are in the discrete manufacturing space they seem to be focused a lot more in the direct to consumer verticals consumer goods vertical in a lot in the b2c space i don't know how strong or they want to go after b2b uh, or complex manufacturing because obviously they have uh, you know far fiercer competitors when you look at the complex manufacturing uh, and uh, the b2b space here they are saying uh, um, Consona acquired several additional ERP product line, DTR, Simnet system, Access, uh, Mcompex, uh, Intuitive, Relevant, Supply Works. Oh my goodness! Uh, you know these are different ERP systems that they still probably carry, and there are at least you know 100 to 200 different products that they are still managing. Um, now uh, the company entered the customer relationship management market after it acquired onyx crm obviously onyx crm is very well known uh you know they ended up acquiring that in 2006 uh, that's where they entered into the crm market uh probably they wanted to attack uh, you know salesforce obviously they were not very successful uh, <laughs> in doing that uh, but that's when the crm market really heated up in somewhere around 2005 uh when uh, the market was really picking up um uh what else do we have uh the consona acquired the nova service and support knowledge management system and launched the company's consona crm division they still have crm division in early 2017 seven to avoid uh confusion between made to manage erp solution and the company m2m holdings the company changed its name from consona corporation to represent its new position as a crm and erp uh software and service provider so they used to call m2m made to manage but then they changed the name just changing the name is not going to change your product strategy you still have that technical debt you still have that baggage that you are carrying just uh, you know by changing the marketing and branding you can't really get rid of all of that technical debt um so and from the customer's perspective you really pay, need to pay attention to that technical debt that they are carrying from uh from ages uh here they are saying in 2008 uh, they acquired uh yeah they acquired a bunch of bars i mean that is very common uh they also acquired the support automation software vendor called support soft so obviously they wanted to do a little bit of crm a little bit of erp they were not sure what they wanted to do uh but right now i don't know whether they position themselves as more of the crm company or the erp company my understanding is that they are probably, uh, you know, leading more towards the ERP and they must be reducing their footprint. And just like other companies uh, like ECI or, or N4, they are trying to reduce their footprint on the edge uh, component because obviously they all want to be ERP company. Yeah, made, made to manage has been around since the 80s, as, as it states there, and they were originally developed using the COBOL uh, language. Uh, back at, which was very popular in the 80s. Um, they've done some over, they've been bought and sold a few times as, it, as, as noted, but they've done some R&D towards it. And recently, I mean, the, I don't really hear about them going after new companies or new customers, but they have come up with some new versions that makes the screens look nicer, uh, trying to maintain their existing customer base. The same thing with Intuitive, which they came out in 1996 originally, and they were designed uh, for repetitive long run type manufacturing. Um, they've been bought and sold a few times too, and uh, they've had some hit and miss in regard. To, they realized, I think, pretty quickly that there was a lot larger opportunity in the, in the discrete manufacturing than there was in repetitive long run. And so they tried to diversify, but they weren't that successful. 
uh, in complex and relevant, that's that's a really interesting combination because they're both t- targeted at uh, project management type companies. Uh, so it's interesting. They've got two products that target the same market. The other one that's kind of interesting is DTR because that one's designed for more plastics types companies. But yep. it, it is a very diverse uh, cornucopia of systems, that's for sure. So from your experience, Andy, obviously we cannot simply go by the way their marketing is, is structured because we have seen in case of ERP companies, they are not necessarily as great at marketing the way they want to position themselves. So right now, if we look at Actine, you know, their first vertical, the way it is listed is really the food and process vertical. Is right. that their first, uh, you know, uh, go to market as well? Or yeah. are they going equally after the district market as well? Well, Ross, like you mentioned already, is the largest, you know, the most been around a long time and a very popular system in the process manufacturing industry. And that's, you know, been their really their their uh, flagship system across the entire group. Um, I was just commenting that, you know, to call made to manage their flagship system is kind of would be a relatively weak flagship. Yeah, so I don't know how much install base they have. Uh, you know, I looked at the screen of Ross as well. It does not seem to be very complex product, to be honest. Uh, it appears to be slightly simpler uh, product. Uh, but I have seen Process Pro being used roughly at what eighty two hundred million dollar companies. Uh, Absolutely. They started, they... Pro, yeah, it's very popular. It's it's because Process Pro is more of an add on to accounting systems. Whereas yeah, but they do Ross, struggle at that manage, point. These are all full ERPs. They struggle, uh, you know, to manage the companies uh, in my experience at that point. So I don't know what is the target market of Process Pro if they are targeted more towards, uh, you know, 80 million uh, and down uh, or it is going to be slightly larger accounts. Uh, You know, we have some reviews where we have seen some really large companies using Aptine. So it's not clear which, uh, you know, market they really want to go after. And obviously from their market positioning, it's all over the place. It's very, very, very hard to discern. Yeah, okay, what is your target market? Can you please tell I, me? I know a company in, I think there was Saskatchewan or Manitoba. I'm not sure. They were a small process manufacturer. And uh, they purchased the process pro. So I should give them a call one of these days and see how they're liking it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good idea. So, okay. So now, uh, you know, we are going to move along here. So here, uh, you know, we have some more news that we have gone back in time to see how their strategy was and why they sort of, uh, you know, did these uh, movements uh, in the market. So here, uh, when T- TA and Vista, uh, you know, they got together, they actually wanted to be equal partners, each investing new equity to acquire Aptin from uh, the separate Vista, Vista fund that initially invested in the company in, in 2012. So here they are saying, enabling the company to leverage TA's global add-on acquisition origination and integration capabilities along with Vista's, Vista's uh, proven operational expertise with the aim of positioning Aptine for substantial organic and inorganic growth. So they are trying to attack both. Typically companies take just one strategy here. They are trying to do both, uh, you know? So again, it's very, it's not clear from the product roadmap perspective, what are they trying to do with these products or with the acquisition? Uh, I would like to see a little bit more clarity in the direction of the company because as a customer, you need to know what are you going to do with those products? You have 200 products in your portfolio. Are they going to be killed? Are they not going to be killed? Uh, So you need to make your mind uh, in stating that. Um, Here they are saying over the past year, we streamlined and refocused Aptin's product portfolio through the divestures of Aptin's public sector healthcare and vertical business application assets. So guys, this is very common that we in four has, you know, spun off a lot of different vertical applications because they actually wanted to be an ERP company. Here, you can clearly see that they actually removed a lot of different vertical application. They didn't want to present in uh, public sector healthcare. Uh, and, you know, uh, and this is the very common trend. So I don't know if that is going to happen with the other products or not, because they are still carrying a lot of edge products. They are still acquiring very actively, they are very aggressive uh, in the market right now. So uh, here they are saying in 2000, in July 2018, Aptine announced the divestiture of the public sector and healthcare assets, uh, which we already covered. Uh, 
and the company sold its vertical. Okay, so that's the similar point. So the point that I really wanted to cover is they are trying to, uh, you know, spin off some of their capability. So maybe they want to go after the food vertical, manufacturing vertical, uh, but the acquisition strategy is very strange as well because they are going after some of these small international markets. So I don't know, uh, you know, what exactly are they trying to do from the company perspective is not clear. Okay, so we have some more stories here that we have gone back in time. This is coming from 2020, and this is the Paragon uh, acquisition, and that's where they got the transportation management software. Obviously, that's a huge, uh, you know, addition to the portfolio if you are trying to win as the ERP company. By the way, that also provides you sort of foot in the door when companies are actually going to come. Just with the WMS or TMS component, you are going to sell that, and then your goal is going to be to sell uh, ERP. So here they are saying with proven solutions that assist its customers uh, with routing, uh, you know, logistics, scheduling, and home delivery. Guys, home delivery is a real problem. If you are in the DTC space, home delivery space, okay, it's very, 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 very hard to work with an ERP solution such as your Acumatic and NetSuite, SAP Business One, Microsoft, uh, you know, Business Central, because home delivery is a different beast. And that could be the place where Aptin really wanted to play because they have a lot of DTC play. The way their products are structured, they are very lighter in functionality. Just the way you are going to feel any of the products that were designed for the smaller e-commerce shops. And these e-commerce shops could be your food and beverage uh, manufacturing as well, right? So for example, DCOM solution, if you look at DCOM uh, from ECI, it feels very, very, very small. It's a very light product but it provides all the bells and whistles that a very small food and beverage or the process manufacturer is going to require. So that is probably the space that they are trying to move into because obviously the DTC companies, I can count on my fingers right now. It, it has roughly what, 10 <laughs> ERP solutions that nobody knows. <laughs> uh, what what size of company do you think Decon targets, Sam? Decom is going to be it's very- small, so what does that mean? Uh, QuickBooks play. Uh, so typically the compar comparable there is going to be wow. when you are on QuickBooks and then you are looking for slightly more sophisticated app that is going to be integrated. It's wow. going to provide uh, your, uh, you know, travel accounting, the route accounting, uh, you know, a POS like functionality, uh, you know, all of the, your, uh, the route planning. Now that is not to say that they are trying to compare, compete with Oracle TMS uh, or SAP AWM. There is no way. <laughs> okay, those are two different spaces, but their product is far richer overall. Uh, you know, in the smaller space. So when you are when you are making the comparison between your your QuickBooks versus Decom, Decom is an amazing solution. When you are sure. comparing this with any other products in the ECI portfolio, Decom is an amazing solution. My expectation here is going to be most of the uh, you know products that Aptin has. Aptin has actually sold in some of the larger accounts as well. But I don't know how large you could be, uh, you know, when you are really going to outgrow FD. Um, so here in this particular case, they have got roughly what? With more than 4,700 systems de deployed globally today. So they got 4,700 customers just because of Paragon acquisition. Uh, Paragon solutions are, uh, you know, already helping. It's more than 300 customers transform their delivery models, including many household names. Uh, name brands in the food and beverage, retail, grocery, distribution, and pharmaceutical sectors. Uh, we have we see numerous growth opportunities given for uh, you know Paragon's strength in route optimizing and home delivery capabilities. So, Dave, I am going to uh, uh, answer Ender's question. The question that you asked, okay, how often do you see the TMS capabilities in the uh, in the uh, SMB space? So, typically, if you are going to be in these verticals, which is going to be your F and B retail, grocery, distribution, pharmaceutical. This is where you have the play of the logistics. This is where you have the play for supply chain. In fact, if you actually look at the any profiles of the supply chain professionals, okay, in most cases, 80% of the time, they are going to be focusing on these industries because this is where the real supply chain play is. The supply chain play is not as strong in, let's say, if you talk about machine shops, I mean, what can you do from the supply chain perspective their automotive sure i mean you could have supply chain challenges but this is where the real tms capabilities are going to be relevant and this is why uh, you know they acquired paragon because paragon was very uh, strong in those uh, 
food and beverage uh, vertical where they need WMS, TMS. And now the solution could be very strong with home delivery uh, and uh, meeting the shipping needs that food and beverage companies typically need. That makes sense, Sam. I, I was curious, how do you take that first line on there? Do, does Paragon have 4,700 systems or are they saying Aptian uh, has 4,700 systems? Because right behind that, it says it's helping more than 300 customers. So I was trying to, when I read that earlier today, I was trying to make sense out of what that was saying. So I was just curious what your take was. Huh, so that's a very interesting comment. Uh, the way I would read it, because, you know, Paragon's solution is right by, uh, you know, the statement that is made for 4,700, my expectation is going to be that that's made about the Paragon's solutions. But then they are also saying Paragon solutions are already helping. It's more than 300. It's more than 300 transformed their delivery models, including many. Uh, not Maybe sure. it's only 300 <laughs> of the 4,700 that they're transforming the delivery models with this is very tricky i'm not going to comment because i just yeah, don't know yeah knows? we don't have You're enough right. information right now <laughs> but good catch yeah. uh, okay now uh here okay so here this is the comment or the commentary that is coming from tech organization which is uh, you know canada based uh, and this is the commentary i don't have the date i think this was uh, uh, somewhere in 2012, if I recall correctly, and they had called out that at first glance, the merger looks like a mini in four, which is true as well, okay? Because obviously they were not trying to get into the enterprise space. They wanted to attack with the SMB space, super small, but the corporate strategy was similar as in four. And that's why this analyst had called, uh, you know, it mini in four. Uh, and see, I mean, they are also talking about in fours, Aggressive consolidation uh, base uh, in four has done a lot of acquisition. They stopped it. They are not acquiring anymore. They are not. Uh, they are acquiring, but they are not as aggressive, uh, especially in acquiring the competing or the overlapping ERP system. But ECI and FT, they are going nuts in acquiring these overlapping ERP systems. Uh, they have also called Mini Sage. I'm not too sure if that is true, to be honest. Uh, you know, Mini Sage. Yes, Sage has acquired a lot of different systems, but they have not gone as aggressive as some of these other companies that are going to be private equity owned. Uh, Sage has similar strategy, I would say, uh, compared to Epicor probably. Uh, you know, they are definitely not as aggressive in the acquisition game. Uh, here, uh, they have a comment for Onyx and Pivotal CRM, which were very popular CRM products, uh, are apparently meant to be together after all. Uh, you know, again, uh, I think there was a little play there. Uh, so again, uh, as of today, we are not sure whether they are trying to be more of the CRM company or ERP company. There is a clear distinction between CRM play and the ERP play. And it seems like, uh, you know, they are not good, as good as the CRM company, and they are not as good as the ERP company. Uh, you are probably better off if you actually pick your bets. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be ERP company or I'm going to be CRM company. Uh, but we'll see how, uh, you know, they... Uh, perform overall as a company. Uh, here, uh, we have some other commentary here. Uh, we have the CDC factory for the manufacturing intelligence. That's where the manufacturing intelligence product came. They have Pivotal CRM in the portfolio, Catalyst for warehouse management. So they have warehouse management as well. And, uh, you know, a plus, uh, so many cloud apps, most notably Trade Beam for global trade management. Now, global trade management, as we saw, in case of Oracle QED, only the bigger companies are going to have, but they have the small component of global trade management, which is very rare to find in the smaller ERP system. So kudos to our team that they are able to find these uh, you know, niche functionality that only they are going to have. And obviously, they are winning because of that. Uh, they, on the Consona side, I think the Consona was the discrete uh, you know, manufacturing. There, there are made to manage and intuitive manufacturing, uh, both generic discrete ERP systems uh, in whose company also the configured solutions. Uh, they have a little bit of, you know, configured code to order. Uh, and then they had five or six different ERP systems. I think Andy, you had a great commentary there for these systems, uh, you know, all very industry-based ERP systems. And then comes the separate CRM division. So they have, as part of CRM, they have at least four or five different, uh, you know, products that are part of that. And then you have the compare, 
uh, an open source distribution ERP. Now, guys, this is a very interesting comment. People talk about Odoo all the time that, okay, uh, you know, open source is a thing. Open source was always a thing. It didn't work in the ERP space. <laughs> That's why, you know, this open source company ended up selling to, to F team, uh, you know, so you can see the future of open source ERP. It doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is number one, ERP is a very different product overall. It's not meant to be your technical product. It's not meant to be your software product. It's a very business product. Uh, you know, you have a lot of different variables that go along with the ERP. It could be very disruptive for the companies. The other technical products may not be as disruptive because they don't impact the company as much. Uh, and that's why the ERP is a very different beast uh, overall from the product perspective. Okay, so I'm actually going to move to the next slide if you guys don't have any comments. Okay, so here, now let's look at their uh, you know, presentation of the industries. And one of the things that you are going to notice is obviously they are really, really good at marketing. Okay, when I say good at marketing, at least the graphic design piece. Okay, you are going to see very pretty uh, you know, uh, marketing positioning. I don't know how strong they are overall from the marketing strategy perspective, but we'll find out. So here, you know, at the least with the industry, Sam, we're not doing it just alphabetized. Exactly. So that would say that, that you know, implies. they are probably good at marketing, right, Andy? <laughs> uh, and there are very few ERP companies that have, uh, I would say 90% of them are alphabetical. So uh, kudos to Appian that they at least understand marketing. Uh, you know, so here, the very first industry that they have highlighted is the food and beverage. And that's going to be my expectation as well, that they are trying to target slightly more DDC companies. They are trying to target the companies that are going to be in the home delivery space that are going to be very supply chain focused, uh, you know, those food retail, food manufacturer, the process manufacturing, as opposed to the complex discrete verticals, that's not their play. Okay, that, that's going to be my expectation. They have not spelled out, but that's how it appears overall from the story perspective. Now, the second, uh, you know, that, that they have identified is the process manufacturing. Okay, we are going to drill a little deeper into that, what capabilities they have in each of those industries. Uh, the third one they have is the industrial manufacturing. Now, we are going to dig a little deeper into that. When they say industrial manufacturing, what do they mean by industrial manufacturing? So here on the right side, if you actually see, they have the four industry segments, which is going to be computer and electronics, electrical equipment, fabricated metals, and the transportation equipment. But if you drill deeper into those, they are going to be very consumerized uh, manufacturing verticals as opposed to complex manufacturing vertical, okay? Because they do really, really well in that B2C consumerized space as opposed to very complex B2B functionality. So pay attention to how they are trying to position. Even though they are saying trans transportation equipment, I really don't believe that they are going to be, uh, you know, strong at very large transportation equipment. They are probably going to be, uh, you know, strong at very small, uh, you know, cheaper products as opposed to uh, expensive products. Less uh, complex. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the same goes for the electrical equipment. Majority of the electrical equipment manufacturing is very, very low dollar, you know, uh, in, in, in general. Uh, so yeah, that's probably the reason why they have highlighted and they don't have any other industrial manufacturing uh, verticals that they have identified here. In the food and beverage, they have a lot. They have bakery, they have beverages, they have confectionery, uh, dairy. Uh, I'm actually impressed by the uh, the granularity that they have. And each of these verticals are very unique in the way they operate. Their production processes are very, very, very unique. The way the product uh, moves through the production cycle is very unique. You really need to know that industry if you want to operate in that space, to be honest. So process verticals are far trickier in general compared to your discrete verticals in my experience. Now, uh, let's look at the process manufacturing. So in case of, by the way, they have, uh, you know, differentiated and Dave, I would like to see your commentary here uh, because, you know, they have uh, differentiated between the process manufacturing and food and beverage. In case of process manufacturing, they are saying cannabis uh, chemical. So I think they are going more after, you know, that are going to be slightly more medicine again process manufacturing could mean a lot of different things uh, okay and only not only these verticals are part of the process manufacturing there are far more but they are going after pharma like verticals uh, cannabis like verticals food like verticals in a lot of ways yeah it was interesting to see uh, cannabis pop up on this list uh, specifically so yeah kind of digging into it it's uh, 
at least based on what I was able to see with their marketing, uh, it doesn't look like in that space specifically that they are very deep. I couldn't find any case studies uh, specific to that industry, uh, taking a little bit of a dig, uh, a deeper dive um, because they talked about one of the uh, uh, brochures I was able to get uh, access to that, which by the way, I did like, because it was not gated. Some of their content is gated. Some of it is not. So that was worth mentioning. But uh, one of the, the areas they talked about, uh, specific in the cannabis space, uh, there is a, on the regulatory compliance side, there are, uh, three, basically three major systems, uh, that from a regulatory compliance that the individual States, uh, will have an agreement with for seed to sale tracking, and Aptin uh, specifically says that they uh, have the ability to interface. And I looked at the kind of number one player out of those three, and I did not see um, where they have an integration currently. So it leads me to wonder if this is more of a marketing play to see if we can get into this market and then you know figure out the solution based on some of the other things that they've learned, uh, which wouldn't be any different than some other you know, companies that we've reviewed, but that, that was my takeaway on the cannabis specifically. Yeah. But to be fair with them, to be honest, they are not at least trying to sell a discrete solution to a cannabis company because that's probably going to be a disaster. We have seen cases where, uh, you know, companies like NetSuite or Acumatica, they don't really have that inbuilt process manufacturing functionality built, uh, but they'll proudly claim that they are going after these verticals, uh, you know, using through add-ons or something else. And sometimes they are simply saying that, you know, native product can work. Uh, which is a very, you know, they have light discrete functionality. It's not really designed for process manufacturing. In case of Aptine, at least they are spelling out and they have very deep process manufacturing capabilities. Well, Ross probably fits the first three criteria, uh, food and beverage, process manufacturing, and import distribution and retail. Uh, not so much industrial manufacturing, but, but the Ross product is probably strong in all those three areas. I agree. I looked at the product and it has really good, uh, you know, traceability. So it, it felt as if it's the process manufacturing product. But again, overall, from the complexity perspective, it's a very light product in general. So I don't know how big companies are really using ROS. It'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, what is their exit point, uh, you know, overall from the size of the product perspective. The other observation I have that's on this slide is I have never seen a company that does 3PL from the ERP perspective, to be honest, at least the mainstream ERP players. And this is the first time I was like, okay, if I get a 3PL client, I am actually going to call a team. So I dig a little deeper into that. Okay, we really have these 3PL capabilities or you're simply swelling out. So we are going to review what they have for 3PL because 3PL is a very different piece. It's a it's a completely different play with your, uh, you know, the way your orders are going to be is going to be very different. The way you are going to schedule your workloads is going to be very different. The way you manage your hops, uh, you know, as you are trying to schedule is going to be very different. So I was really impressed to see that, okay, they are probably going to have uh, those capabilities, uh, but no, Aptine does not have that. So we are going to review that. Um, so here, uh, you know, I was also interested in knowing, okay, what do they have for financial services? Because, you know, as soon as you tell me, okay, you have something for financial services, I want to review the unique capabilities that are going to be relevant for financial services, just like the way I would like to see in Sage Intact or, uh, you know, NetSuite, those, uh, you know, solutions do really well in the financial services space because they have a lot of native capabilities that are going to be required in those spaces. Uh, you know, we saw in case of Salesforce, Salesforce, I think, does really well in the financial services space because even though it's a CRM company, they still have very deep, uh, you know, industry functionality built as part of the CRM solution. But in their case, when when uh, we looked at it, you know, banking, consumer credit, insurance, and the only thing they have is the claims management. It's not even an ERP. So from the marketing perspective. It's structured, you know, I'm going to go, I'm actually going to buy an ERP. I'm looking for an ERP. I'm coming to Aptin, buying an ERP. But the only thing they have is a very point solution, which is for the claims management. It has no relationship with the ERP. So I was a little disappointed overall, to be honest. Uh, you know, maybe have a separate area rather than, you know, doing it in, in, at the same level. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I could not find the ERP functionality in these industries. The same thing goes for the biotech and life sciences. The way they have identified their verticals are very, very different. They just have one product, which has nothing to do with ERP, to be honest. 
okay just uh, some ip patent search uh, product and they are bundling as part of erp sure the company is probably going to require that software to run their operations maybe it needs to be integrated with the operation workflow but that's not the mainstream product that these companies are going to need and that is the only thing that they are trying to sell to these industries they don't really have any sort of erp play in those verticals here uh you know as i said you know the uh pharma and biotech is the ip search is the product name <laughs> okay it's not even the, the operational product for example let's say if you talk about limbs uh library information management that has far deeper operational capabilities you require that as part of your erp because that's how your operational workflows are structured i'm not too sure you know what erp company is doing in the ip search space i just don't get it uh you know so for these companies these are very professional services research centric companies for them it could be very thick functionality that they need this but it's a very 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 different solution so i don't know why that is structured as part of the erp and if they are ever going to integrate this as part of the erp um now the same thing goes for banking banking is the complaints management seems like a very crm play uh, but again it's not clear uh, you know whether it's crm erp it could be very confusing for the customers when they are looking for an ERP in these spaces. You think it's as clear as what it describes, banking complaints management, so just managing the complaints they get? Well, so customers are not going to be as sophisticated the way they operate, you know, from the customer journey perspective, they are going to go and click on their industries. Uh, sure, they might feel that, you know what, they are able to do complaints management, but they might be able to do ERP as well, because I'm actually going to the ERP company. So sometimes it could be really misleading for the customers when you are selling very niche product that has nothing to do with ERP that is bundled as part of the same portfolio for the customers. In my mind, I think it, it could be very confusing. It was at least confusing for me, to be honest. Uh, okay, so the same thing goes for the consumer uh, credit complaints management. Uh, you know, again, they don't really have any sort of ERP play. Uh, it says industries, financial services. Uh, they are doing something in those industries. Why they are doing that? What is that corporate strategy? What are they trying to do with these products? I have no clue whether they are trying to expand. They are trying to sell more ERP, but they don't really have any sort of presence in that. So I really don't know what they are trying to do from the company perspective. The same thing goes for the insurance complaints management. Uh, you know, I don't even know why you are in that vertical. <laughs> you have nothing to do in that vertical. Okay, unless you are trying to sell ERP in the insurance space, that's a different beast. Okay, if you're trying to do that, then be in that space. But insurance, it's just the outlier. Why are you there? I, I have no clue. Maybe uh, maybe their customer gets a lot of complaints. <laughs> I have no comments there, Andy. <laughs> We are going to review uh, the user reviews as well, whether they are getting the you know complaints or not. But we'll 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 check that. Uh, good joke. Uh, now uh, you know we are actually looking at the three PL capabilities, and three PL is something that I was really you know wanted to find out if I can find an ERP that is going to work for three PL uh, space. So far, I have not found any ERP. Uh, it, there are a lot of challenges in that space. So here I'm looking at that. You know, it has distribution ERP. It has distribution and retail WMS. Guys, this retail WMS is a very different WMS than a 3PL company. <laughs> okay, 3PL processes are very complex in the custom brokerage space. The way they are going to be structuring their orders, the way they are going to be scheduling their workloads, it's, it's very different. I mean, just because you are able to do the TMS for the retail space, it's not same as 3PL, but they have called it out as 3PL. So they have said, Distribution and retail uh, routing and scheduling, distribution and retail proof of delivery. The way I think the, their products are structured, they are targeted for small food and beverage companies. Okay, the companies that are going to be managing their own fleets when they are small, that's where Aptin is going to be a great fit, but it's not necessarily going to work for the 3PL companies. Okay, if you look at their uh, you know data sheet, here also they have very clearly identified that they are looking at automated Distribution resource planning, collaborative forecasting. That is going to be, I don't know in the smaller space if a lot of companies actually do collaborative forecasting. And if they are able to do collaborative forecasting, to be honest, because that could be very complex. Uh, I don't know if they are able to do that. If they are able to do that, then probably companies don't need Anna plan because that's where uh, you know companies spend a lot of money <laughs> in buying those products. Uh, but seems like Aptin is claiming that they can do a lot of that. 
Uh, they have DTC shipping functionality. That's very unique, guys. If you are in the DTC space, you took uh, you should take a serious look at this one uh, because that's very, very, very hard to accomplish. Uh, the DTC shipping uh, built in for DTC shipping. Again, they have that automated DR DRP uh, and forecasting. So yeah, a lot of things from that small food to beverage manufacturing perspective and the distribution perspective, I think they have a lot of challenges overall in the TMS space, the way they do their home delivery, the way they do their uh, you know food delivery. That's why uh, that's where I think Aptin is trying to play. They are not necessarily playing in the transportation industry where you have the real 3 PLs. Uh, okay. Uh, they have a lot of different ERP systems. So this is a uh, this is the Aptin full circle ERP, uh, and this is where they have clarified. So each industry vertical is going to have one product. Uh, the full circle ERP is positioned for the apparel, uh, you know, vertical. And I was actually trying to find unique functionality that they might have. Obviously, they have PLM, and PLM in this space is going to be very unique. Uh, uh, the other PLM, uh, you know, functions are going to be slightly different. Here they have the mass sales order adjusting. Uh, in this particular space, maybe you need that. Uh, Real-time sales rep order forecasting. Uh, you have distribution scan and pack. You have goods reserve allocation. Uh, you have finished goods allocation. My expectation is going to be, uh, if you talk about finished good allocation, that's not very unique feature as such. Uh, probably that might work with most mainstream ERP systems. Uh, I don't know why they are claiming that this is probably unique to this industry. I don't know if there are any intricacies there, uh, but there seems to be a little bit of uh, you know functionality for the apparel industry. The, the, uh, the most important thing that they have not identified here, which is going to be matrix inventory, uh, you know, which they probably should identify because matrix inventory is very challenging when the product is not really designed for the matrix inventory scenario. And that's where if you are going to use, a, a, for example, in four cloud suite industrial for the apparel vertical, it's going to be a terrible fit. Uh, the reason why it is going to be a terrible fit is because it's not really designed for the apparel industry. Apparel industry is very unique. Overall, the way they uh, structure their SKUs, the way they structure their inventory, they have not identified that. They have identified a lot of other things uh, size, style, color. Exactly, exactly. You got it. Uh, okay, so here we have this is the product uh, uh, screen, and obviously they have a lot of different ones. So here, in case of process manufacturing, they have Process Pro, they have Ross, and both of them are are obviously very popular product. What I have personally seen is in very small space. I have seen Process Pro to be installed in roughly 100 million, and then they started struggling. So I don't know what their play is. They have not mentioned anywhere how they sort of segment their product, which is which product is going to be for which market. That's very, very, very hard to find out. Uh, I would like to see some clarity in terms of which market, which uh, product is positioned for which target market. You would uh, think the Ross product would be more of their flagship for process and then only Process Pro when it's a smaller type company that uh, that doesn't want to change your accounting. So honestly speaking, I don't know what their cloud native strategy is. So when companies are carrying two different products, typically one is going to be very strong and on-prem, on it's going to be a legacy product. And then you have the upcoming child that is going to be slightly prettier. It's going to be lighter in functionality. When I look at Ross, Ross does appear very cloud native. Obviously, it seems to be a small product, to be honest. The way the screens were structured, the way the data correlation was that on screens, uh, I just could not see very large companies being managed on ROS. Uh, but it will be interesting to see uh, whether ROS has been sold in, in larger companies. Process Pro, I have not looked at these screens. Uh, maybe that's the on-prem version. Maybe that's legacy product. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know why they have two products uh, for the same vertical. Or maybe they are segmenting based on, uh, you know, different verticals. Uh, but they have... You know, food and beverage is again, you know, one more vertical, which could be very confusing because you have the process manufacturing and then you have the food and beverage. So food and beverage is different than process. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. Okay, so here they are saying food and beverage ERP enterprise addition. You have the food and beverage ERP just food addition. You have a food and beverage ERP BC food addition uh, and then food and beverage ERP link fresh addition. So in case of food and beverage, obviously, when you looked at those thin slices, 
for example, bakery. Bakery is a very different business than your frozen manufacturing because they are going to be very different overall from the process perspective. So each of these uh, products must be targeting those small niches. But again, it's not very clear in terms of which are the products that they really want to focus on and which are the products that are going to be their go-to-market uh, products. Then in case of distribution and retail, again, I don't think they do pure play distribution. Therefore, them, the distribution is going to be food, uh, you know, beverage, retail centric, DTC distribution. That's a very different distribution than actually <laughs> B2B distribution, industrial distribution. Uh, so pay attention to th these things. So here they are saying they have Aptin distribution ERP, they have Aptin full circle ERP, then they have full circle light ERP. Then they are also in the equipment dealer management space. Obviously, uh, I uh, so that seems like an ERP as well uh, because it, they have called it as an ERP. So they have a play there. Uh, in the industrial manufacturing space, they have what? Three or four or five or maybe seven or eight. Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> they, they have made to manage. Uh, they have work-wise. Sorry, eight. you had a eight, right? Yes. Okay. Work-wise, intuitive, metal CRP, uh, N-Compex, uh, then Simnet, DTR, uh, Compiers. I mean, uh, and they're missing relevant on there as well. In, in the next twenty years, if I, if I can remember the names of these products, I will be very proud. Okay. Now you <laughs> are talking about maintaining the legacy code base of these products and making them cloud native. Uh, you know, and providing the deep industry functionality that these companies are going to require is going to be a tall order. Uh, you know, and they have a lot of different edge apps. They have you know a lot of app. Uh, you know, uh, apps in the OEE space, MES, EM, TMS, WMS, PLM, compliance, you name it. They have solution for everything. <laughs> uh, it's crazy, uh, you know, the way it's, it's very confusing for the customers, obviously, from the PE standpoint, when you are trying to sell the company in the next five years, you are going to do anything and everything in your power uh, to grow as fast as possible. But from the customer's perspective, I'm not sure how good that strategy is. Uh, okay, so we are going to review some of the comments here. Uh, you know, some of the things that we typically notice in this space when you are going to have the integrated solution. One of the things that you are going to notice is order fulfillment and shipping is not done through this system. Another system is linked to it to complete the process. As we all know, when you have so many different systems, obviously that's going to feel very different experience overall. It's going to feel as if you are using five different systems, and that's why they have so many different products. It will never feel as if you are using one product. Uh, here they are saying flexibility in maintaining the areas of operations where things typically get murky. Think manufacturing or importing from foreign suppliers. Okay, so they are really good in that international, uh, you know, import space. But the other things, I'm not too sure because they have the global trade management functionality that you are not going to find in the other ERP systems. And that could be very hard to pull off if you are in that space. Uh, then they, one of the downside that they have very clearly heard, the downside is no documentation on the code base. We are granted 90% of the source code. So I can look at what they can do and figure out a solution. But documentation would be very useful. Now, this is the intuitive ERP. I'm not too sure if they are exposing their code base for all other ERPs. Maybe this was the open source ERP. That's the reason why you might have the source code. But without documentation, I don't know any ERP consultant who can function, who can do their job. So well, I don't know. Intuitive was originally designed using the Access database in the late 90s. They've migrated to SQL Server since, but giving them the... I, I knew with the Access system, they did have availability to do your own changes in code but i didn't think that was the case with the sql server version but maybe i'm wrong yeah uh, it's it's very interesting and the other comment that you're going to see notice here andy is going to be they provide no support for customizations obviously that's going to be very common across the erp companies that you know if you are going to have customizations you have to own them that's your deal that's not erp company's deal so you know before doing any customization you really need to think through Okay, so here they are saying they refuse to even tell anyone what a method or a base class does unless you pay them $200 an hour. Uh, so obviously, uh, support has a lot of challenges. And when you are not going to have documentation, even if you are uh, you know, operating in the open source community, you even the consultants need documentation. They cannot uh, you know, uh, use the product unless you have the documentation. 
think of the uh, truck uh, uh, mechanics. I mean, they need documentation from <laughs> truck manufacturers to be able to repair the truck. How do you expect an ERP consultant to be able to, uh, you know, fix a, a, an ERP? And this is very common uh, with companies that are going to carry a lot of legacy products. And that is going to be with the ones that are PE owned. In this case, it's the Aptane, uh, you know, it is, um, uh, it is ECI in four has stopped doing that, but they still have a lot of technical debt from their, you know, back days. Some of the products are still carrying the same feeling where you don't really have enough documentation on the product. So pay attention to the way their help is structured. When you are looking at, uh, you know, any product, you need to look at the corner screens. That's where you are going to find these issues. You, the main screens are, you know, they must have dressed it up. They must have uh, done really comprehensive documentation on the sales order screen, on the customer order screen. When you are going to get into the corner cases, that's where you are going to really struggle. The only thing I was going to add to that, Sam, is I was able to find, I think there were, from my recollection, four or five uh, of the solutions that kind of fell under the open source. So I was able to find a link uh, on the website to that. Uh, so it, it was relatively available for people that uh, are, are taking a look at the solution to kind of figure out if the solution they're actually looking at kind of falls under that and, and maybe have some of those challenges uh, like that reviewer had. And just to be clear, Dave, I mean, when you are looking at that product, you are looking at just one product. Okay, each of right. one product could be great, uh, you know, uh, may have, uh, you know, great documentation, but the other products may struggle because depending upon where it came from, if the team that developed the product, it may be a very small team, but they were really strong at software development. Maybe 20 people develop something like Acumatica. <laughs> there is a possibility. Then the product is going to be very strong. But, you know, if uh, the quality of development is not going to be as good, you are definitely not going to see documentation. Yeah, good point. Okay, so we can take some more comments, guys. Uh, you know, that's it for the session. Dave, Andy? Well, you know, Aptian, their products, like I said at the very beginning of the session, uh, their products have been around for a long time. Um, the, the Ross product, regardless of how strong it is or how strong it isn't, has always been a very popular system with process type manufacturers, you know, very well known in that, in that process, food and beverage, that, that, that target, but the rest of their products, they're, uh, most of them, even though they do spend some R and D to give them a little bit of a, a pretty look, they're mostly longer in the teeth. They are definitely spending a lot on their marketing. I mean, marketing is one of the prettiest, to be honest. I mean, the way it is done, it's one of the best in the industry. Yeah. Uh, I think the next is probably, or Acumatica may be similar to how Appine has done, but their marketing is definitely very compelling. We, we all know that <laughs> marketing is just uh, the truth. To, I mean, a lie told so many times that people believe it eventually, right? <laughs> Yeah, the truth is that, I mean, PE companies are really good at marketing, right? Their goal always is, okay, I'm actually going to buy these legacy products. I am going to decorate them really well uh, and going to sell for far higher price. But obviously, they don't have the software development background to understand how software typically works and what people like in, in a software. Yeah, I think that's the real challenge. I mean, is as good as the marketing looks, when you look at it from the customer journey perspective, you're still left saying, what am I really getting? What's the solution that I'm looking at? And is it right for me? Because as you start to go through even their product vertical pages, um, it, it can get very confusing very quickly. So I, I'm kind of always left with the same thought process as we go through these. <laughs> Amazing, guys. Uh, any other comments? No, thank you very much, Sam. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Of course, if you don't have any other comments, I'm simply going to wrap. So guys, uh, you know, Appian is a great company. There's no question about that. It's very well funded um, by a PE company. And that's a very strong indicator that you should be looking at the financial stability. They might be confusing overall in terms of their corporate strategy, but obviously PE guys are extremely smart. They know what they are doing. Uh, and one of the things that oh, they are always trying to do is they are trying to exit at much higher price. So you need to figure out what is going to happen to uh, you know, when the next owner is going to be here. 
obviously yeah. their goal is also going to be to increase by 5x but there is only so much you can grow a software before that you know you are going to struggle you need to kill some of the products or need to do something so i don't know what that strategy is going to be so right now it's in a very capable hands but what is going to happen when the next owner is going to be here and then you know make sure that you are really paying attention to the product that you are buying and paying attention to the reviews uh, you know on the internet for that specific product each product is different there are 200 different products so you need to be betting a lot you need to pay attention to the contract because sometimes you know the the truth is going to be inside the contract on that note uh, you know your evaluation is going to be far more difficult but you might find some of very deep industry functionality in that smaller spaces which you are not going to find with some of the other erp systems they might not work for your industry you might need to do a lot of manual processing here you are going to get far more if you compare this with odoo or uh, you know quickbooks or any other competing solutions on that note uh, you know i uh, i wanted to thank everybody for their time if you joined for the first time this was part of our industry series for which we meet every tuesday at 5:30 pm eastern we pick one vendor or the solution uh, you know from the erp uh, industry and then we always have a couple of stories from the erp and digital transformation so make sure that you are not going to miss next week's show we are going to be here on that note thanks again everybody for your time and insights thank you very much thanks sam